Good day, class. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to today's session, um, the last session. Um, so I am leaving this video for you. I thought it would be best to do the recording like this so that the students who may be having internet challenges would be able to still find the course content online. Um, today's session will be looking at cultural competence. And so I want you to follow along on the video and feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, for those of you, of members of the public who may be looking at this video, um, this course is, well, this video is part of the Intro to Social Work course with the University of the West Indies Open Campus. Um, right now, um, several students and lecturers as well are having some challenges um, due to the various restrictions our governments and the institutions have put in place for the safety and protection of the region. As you know, we are facing a global issue and so we have had to become very creative in the delivery of our course. And so to my students, I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the course. Um, as your facilitator, we really want, well, I really want to see you succeed and I want to see you do your best. And so if you're having any challenges, please reach out to me as soon as possible. I know the university has indicated that there are counseling services available and I know they're putting things in place, for example, for the extension of um, the submission of assignments, etc. Um, ultimately, I don't want to see any of you have to drop out of the class. And I want to encourage you, if you're having some challenges, that um, oftentimes we tend to doubt our capabilities. But remember, um, a part of being in the helping profession, whether you are a social work student, psychology, sociology, or whatever is your specific major, um, inherent in being a helping professional is the belief that people can improve on their current status and people can fulfill their potential. So I have every confidence that despite whatever challenges you may be facing, that together we can help you, that's if you need help, um, achieve your dreams of completing this course. So please contact me if you're having any challenges at all, whether it be familial, um, whether it be economic issues, um, work complications, internet issues, please contact me. Um, you know my email address. All right, so without further ado, let's get into today's lesson. Social work in a culturally diverse society. So today's class, we're going to explore this idea of the differences between us. The course, this particular lesson at least, will explore some definitions regarding diversity, social exclusion, inclusion and we'll touch on some of the debates or ideas coming out of social justice and how social workers can make an impact on social justice so diversity what is diversity it's understanding that each individual is unique and also recognizing our individual differences so the wheel on the right side shows a variety of issues that or a variety of um, statuses and factors, backgrounds, etc., that can in some circles divide people, but in other areas it can be a source of identity. When we look at people, often we may look at them and make a judgment call based on their age, their physical abilities, gender, race, and even sexual orientation. But on the wider context, we have issues like their communication style, their marital status. What about their parents? What about their education? Which part of the country that they live in? Which part of the country they, they were born in? And all of these things, if we're honest with ourselves, when we hear or learn these facts about people, we begin to paint a particular picture in our mind of who they are 
about their capabilities, about the um, social capital that they have, meaning the people that they're connected to, etc., or their life experiences. Take, for example, um, as a single woman, I always had this notion that I would never marry people or marry men from a particular country because the, the assumption was that all men of this particular country were very aggressive. Or you would hear some woman saying, never get in a relationship with a serviceman because there is a particular assumption about men who may be police officers, um, soldiers, fire officers, etc. And all of these things um, shape who people are and it gives indication in terms of their experience and background. Now, you would know by me having that or having that perspective and um, coming to that conclusion that I would never marry a man from this particular country. That is based on either a stereotype, and remember we would have spoken about stereotypes in our first and second class, and it caused me now to take action. The stereotype would refer to your attitude um, or your perception or your belief about a particular people. And when it becomes discrimination is when I choose to act on it. So let's look now at some definitions before we dig a little bit more into our discussion for today. So culture. You would have heard me talk about culture a lot during the course of this class and saying it depends on your background or your culture. But what is culture? Culture refers to the thoughts, customs, values, and traditional beliefs that define a particular ethnic or racial group that are often transmitted through socialization. You would remember when we were talking about socialization and saying that, you know, sometimes the beliefs that we have about people, about people groups, the practices, the things that we do are often taught to us directly and indirectly through how we are socialized. We talked a bit extensively about this when we were um, discussing gender especially. So culture is not just um, whether you play mass. Culture is not whether you have um, a wife and a girlfriend. Culture is not just dressing up for Jamaica Day or putting on your plaid when, when you have your Independence Day. Culture is all of these things, but it includes the thoughts about it, your values about it. So culture can include religious factors. Culture can include political issues. And we talk about political from um, the broader sense of power dynamics. How do you view women? How do you view men? How do you view the role of a woman in society or the, or the role of a woman in the home as opposed to uh, a man? How do you view, view men or children? How do you view them? Um, and all of these things are shaped by the direct messages we get and the indirect messages we get throughout the course of our life. So all of those things is culture. Now when we come to ethnocentrism, that is the belief that your culture and beliefs are superior to others. And so a good example of this would be during the Holocaust where um, we had, um, there was the, the philosophy of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis that they were the superior culture and class and the Jews were a substandard culture that need that will should have been treated as animals and then you had similarly if you go over to South Africa during the apartheid system you saw that same belief where a particular class of people or a particular of people of a particular hue or particular social status believe that they are superior to others and now in 2020, we see ethnocentrism still alive, where people um, either based on religion, um, still based on race, and in some cases you see people based on class, um, employment, etc., have this belief that people of our culture, people who have who share similar culture and beliefs as as we do, are superior than others who don't. So you would have recalled before I was talking about. Um, how I discriminated when I was younger against men from a particular 
um, country. I won't call the country, obviously, because um, I've since changed. Um, but I can share that when I was younger, I always said, and this was uh, a message that was echoed among the older women in my um, circles as well, um, that you should not get in a relationship with any man who wears a uniform, you know? Um, so the push was, of course, for suit and tie, maybe a doctor's coat or something like that. Um, but as long as it was policeman, etc., um, the assumption was stay away from them. And so the negative treatment of an individual or group based on their race, gender, religion, ethnicity, class, etc., that is um, called discrimination. You can also add orientation, etc. Um, the main thing there is that we want to focus on treatment. So ethnocentrism is the belief, that is a thought, an idea, a philosophy, a way of thinking, but it becomes discrimination when you act on it. It's funny because I eventually married a fireman, right? So even though I used to be very discriminatory, eventually I have, my world was opened up, my eyes were opened to see that not all men in uniforms were bad. Not all men in uniforms were the devil, you know? Um, so let's go on with the definitions. The other definition that you should be familiar with is the idea of social exclusion. Now, social exclusion is um, the United Nations Development Fund defines it as leaving someone out of the mainstream society and depriving them of opportunities for participation in economic, social, and civic processes. So basically, social exclusion is leaving people out of day-to-day -day, um, activities, um, taking away a sense of power, reducing, taking away opportunities, leaving them out, um, taking away their voice, um, excluding them from decisions that um, affect them. And as you all know, I work with children, and one of my passions is making sure that children have a voice. Um, the term when we think of persons with disabilities i can't remember um which advocate had said had quoted it but um it, with regards to the movement for equality for persons living with disabilities they coined the phrase nothing for us without us and when i want you to remember that saying whenever you think of what it means to be um included um, so when we talk about social exclusion, it would be the opposite of that. Leaving people out of the decision-making process, taking away opportunities from persons, um, creating barriers to opportunities, barriers to participate in economic activities and civic processes. Right? The last definition I want us to bear in mind is affirmative action so affirmative action we all understand the concept um, but it's, it's good for you to know the name of it what i like, know that there's a name for what we we all know happens in society especially in the caribbean um, the other term is also known as positive discrimination and this is the practice or policy of favoring individuals belonging to groups known to have been discriminated against previously so practically, what this looks like is, for example, when governments are giving out scholarships and governments would set aside, if they're giving out 100 scholarships, they would set aside 10 scholarships specifically for persons from inner city communities or persons um, who fall within a, whose families fall within a particular income bracket. Affirmative action would be white, predominantly white universities um, ensuring that they include a couple persons um, of color into their intake every year. Say, let's say if they have their 5% of their student population um, must have some hue to their, some other color to their skin, whether it be Latina, um, Asian, Black, um, Green, Martian, whatever, they, they would try to include that. And one of the issues with affirmative action, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and we'll hear um, the realities of it when we talk about um, what it means to be inclusive in our practice, 
is that sometimes it can come across as being tokenistic. And all of us are guilty of it. We watch a lot of the movies on Hollywood and we would um, remember a, um, a couple of years back, about two years ago, when there was the hashtag Oscar so white or Grammys, no, it was Oscar so white. And sometimes when we watch these movies, um, I know it has changed. We've made a lot of strides in the last couple of years. But when I was younger, um, it was almost tokenistic where you could watch the show and be like, okay, so let's see where's the token black man in the movie. Ah, look, one black man, one Asian person. All right, where's the, where's the Mexican? Where's the Spanish person? Where's the Cuban in the story? And literally in those, back in those days, there would be about five extras who would just pop up in the screen to add a little more color. So what that we're talking about is affirmative action practice or policy right now the thing is when we think of diversity and we think of social exclusion we must also consider what oppression means so Zastro defined oppression as the unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power and this unjust exercise of, of power is usually executed by a person or group who believes that they are superior to the victim, who is typically from a minority group. Now, I want to stress that word typically. Um, as we mentioned before, in the case of apartheid, um, the blacks under apartheid were, the black South Africans were oppressed, right? Because the white South Africans were. Well, I, I can't, I don't like to generalize. Most of, some of the white South Africans who perceive themselves as being in a position of power, um, they sought to exercise that authority over the blacks. And you saw that even coming out of slavery, um, where there was a lot of segregation across America and in the Caribbean. Um, and the interesting thing, why I like the fact that they use the word typically, um, if you look back at slavery, the slaves outnumber the masters. Yet, because the um, philosophy of them, of the masters being superior, was so entrenched among the slaves, they never once, well, I no, can't say never once, but because eventually they did rise up. But they were able to... Um, exert that power for a long period of time until eventually the abolition of slavery um, worldwide. So when you think of oppression, you have to think of issues related to power, issues related to authority, issues related to justice, is it fair, and issues related to opportunity. So who are some of the oppressed groups in the Caribbean? So I'll give you a couple minutes, well, one, a couple of 30 seconds to just let your mind run, run and wander. If you consider the Caribbean in particular, who are some of the oppressed groups that you can think of or you can identify? All right, keep thinking. Now I know most of you will because we've discussed this already in class, of course, you will think of the LGBTQIA community. And some of you may even um, throw in persons living with HIV or diagnosed as having AIDS, and you would be correct. Here are some of the other groups that I have included that I believe experience some form of oppression in the Caribbean. Women. We still have... And this one is kind of controversial because I know we have the feminists on one side and we have the menists on the other side. And we are seeing research cropping up more where persons are arguing that men are becoming more marginal marginalized in the Caribbean society as women are being given more and more opportunities. And the thing is, in the Caribbean, um, while that may be true in some societies, we have to take into consideration what the whole Caribbean looks like. We have to understand that not everyone has access to free education in the Caribbean. Not everyone has access to um, good, well-paying jobs. Not everyone 
has access and and some of it is based on just plain geography if you're living um, in a very rural community um, chances are that you may not have the same opportunities as someone living in an urban environment you can but there is still those are things that you still should consider and when it when you consider the expectations placed on women in society to be the um, primary caregiver at home not just for her children but also for um, parents elderly parents grandparents to be the homemaker as well chief cook and bottle washer the financial manager even if she may not be necessarily earning income she is like there's an expectation that she would manage money and somehow she is supposed to still um, know women are still be, are being encouraged to get a job and manage and balance all of these things and so if you consider um, the, the situation or the opportunities again um, not all women have the same opportunities as males do to make it in society if a woman is seen begging on the side of the road society is going to look at her differently than if a man walks house to house and asks to cut grass if a woman asks goes around house to house asking to cut grass for money um the view of it is very different right i won't go too much into lgbtqia plus because we discussed that at length in a previous class but we also have to consider persons who are disabled does the policies the infrastructure in your community facilitate them having equal opportunities in your country do all of the news stations uh do they have provide closed captioning or sign language interpretation for the deaf and hard of hearing no yes so what about ramps do all uh, all of the government buildings um churches mosques mandirs um do what about the buses do they are there is there public transportation for persons with disability and let's let's not even talk about the education system and textbooks in braille is is your country um one that makes provisions for persons who are disabled and as we on that note of persons with disabilities you could just hook arms with persons who have mental health disorders and mental health challenges as well as persons with developmental delays persons who are autistic persons who may have cerebral palsy what about the opportunities for therapy um how many clinics are there are there grants available um do they have special schools available for them is this provided under the social welfare of the government or is it something that parents or families have to fund on their own but of course you know that depends on the particular um, political perspective of the country of your day because if you're in a communist state it's what is um, everything is shared equally however if you're in a more republican state then you have to work for what you want to get another controversial group that i wanted to mention was single fathers um and i felt the need to put to include it um because for a lot of um countries how their legislation is set up it's set up to favor women because again of the the foundation of women being placed at a disadvantage women being the pr seen as the primary caregivers um at one point i don't know if the legislation has changed in trinidad and tobago but at one point if uh a pair if a couple had a child and they were not um legally married um the mother would have the child would automatically get the mother's last name and the father would automatically have to um provide child support and so now when the tables have turned because over the last couple of years mm -hmm. we've had a number of campaigns and teaching and efforts and initiatives to get the fathers back into the home um now we're seeing or at least i'm seeing on the ground an increase in the number of fathers who are being involved in their um, children's lives and you're seeing an increase in single fathers 
and now the mothers are the ones who are going out and working and, and living their best life, leaving the child with the fathers. And when the single fathers go to the courts, the courts, however, still, um, because of how the legislation is written, still give single fathers a hard time to get child support from the mothers. Because in the eyes of the law, I'm not sure if it has changed, but I know um, the associations continue to argue about this. In the eyes of the law, the woman is still the weaker, more vulnerable person, and so she should not necessarily provide child support. So it may be useful for you, especially if you're getting into the social work field, um, to find out how do the laws in your country view single fathers. And then we have the indigent poor. Now there is the indigent poor is the person who live below the poverty line, right? These and why I decided to include them and specify this group as opposed to just the poor. One is because everybody in the Caribbean always says that they're poor. Everybody um, could always do with more money. Everybody's always struggling. Everybody's experiencing hard times. Um, but the the issue is that often when the we look at the indigent poor. There is this perception that they are lazy. Um, you would remember when we talked about the Elizabethan poor laws and the laws in your particular country and how the poor is viewed. Um, we tend to view the indigent poor as people who end up below the poverty line by choice and that they how they don't try to, to elevate or themselves, they don't try to alleviate their issues. Um, and as social workers who are striving to be culturally competent, we have to look beyond our prejudices, we have to look beyond um, what society tells us, and to really find out people's stories. I can't tell you the amount of people I've interacted with, both professionally and um, informally, who have tried, they have tried, they have tried to alleviate themselves, but sometimes some people really are just dealt with a tough, um, a tough hand in life. And so it will take more than just them having sheer willpower to do better for themselves, to actually get themselves out of um, difficult situations. Some people will say, well, it's obia. Some people will talk about generational curses. Um, I also just think some people just have bad luck, you know, and some people are born into systems that do not afford them the opportunities. And this is where social workers come into play. Not every issue can be solved with counseling. Not every issue requires somebody to sit down on a couch and dig into their past and talk about how um, at what point they started to have subconscious feelings for their for their um, their parent. Sometimes we need to pick up placards and protest. Sometimes we need to lobby for changes in policy. Sometimes we need social workers need to go do a law degree and go to the court and represent their clients. And culturally competent social workers understand that. We can't just judge a book by its cover. Now, of course, I must talk about race. That is the, the easy one for everybody to talk about. Um, but beyond race relations in the Caribbean, I also want to highlight the fact that we have an additional layer um, of colorism, right? Now, when we talk about colorism, um, how do you treat persons of a lighter hue than you? And we, I don't need to go into it too much because I think most of you would have done some level of history or understand the impact that slavery has had on the Caribbean where we subconsciously and overtly have this concept of white is right. And even within our own communities, whether you're in an East Indian community, a predominantly African community, um, um, among the Latinas in the Caribbean, um, there is this philosophy that persons who are of a lighter complexion have better chances in life. 
Perhaps this is what gave rise to the bleaching phenomenon in Jamaica. You have different theories and conspiracies. There's lots of documentaries on YouTube. I recommend you go watch it because, of course, people also have the idea that because of colorism in the dance hall industry, that's why people felt the need to um, bleach their skin and then it became a fad, right? A, 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 a habit. Morales and Schaefer explained that social work's goal of social justice can be achieved if each person has the opportunity to develop his or her unique potential and therefore make his or her maximum contribution to society. And while this seems like a nice definition of how to achieve social justice, the key thing that I want to talk about is opportunity. If you get into discussions about social inclusion and access, um, you're going to come up with some contrary, well, not contrary, some controversial issues. Is it an issue of social inclusion that we really want to, to have, meaning persons being invited to the party? Or is it an issue of fusion we're trying to push for, where they're not just invited to the party, but they are part of the party planning process. We take into consideration their preferences, their likes. They are the co-MC. They, so they are DJing with whatever music they, they like as well. We're, in, we're bringing um, drinks of their choice. We're streaming, taking into consideration that they may use a wheelchair. Um, so is it just inclusion? And how do we view inclusion? One person, and, and I will um, link the video in the, um, attach it to this particular video, um, a TEDx professor attached to, I think it was Harvard, was making the point that just giving a person access doesn't necessarily equate to inclusion. You give a person access without understanding their background they may not necessarily, um, how they view that access is different from another person. So for example, um, the, the uh, person in the TEDx um, talk was making mention that um, when he was invited, when he got into university, the lecturer would have announced that, you know, his office hours, their office hours will between six and seven, just like I do all the time. Say my Skype office hours are between six and seven on a Sunday. And he was making the point that a lot of the children from the poorer, um, poorer backgrounds who came from inner city communities assumed that office hours meant that that was the time that the lecturer would correct papers, do their work, and that is the time that students should not disturb them, that they would have had to meet and interact with them outside of those office hours. Access does not necessarily mean inclusion. Then we also have the idea that the system, we hear the talk uh, when we're talking about inclusion, that the system is against me. The system itself is designed to fight down the man. The, the laws, the policies, and we talked a little bit about this when I mentioned the plight of the Single Fathers Association in Trinidad and Tobago, right? And really, so when we think of social justice, we have to take into consideration that sometimes we as social workers, we as helping professionals, when we design programs, when we design policies, and even when we interact on a direct level providing counsel and therapy when we apply theories and models we can be kind of tokenistic in our approach and that is not cultural competence cultural competence takes into consideration the the core golden rule doing unto others what we would want done to us the international federation of social work highlights some core values of the profession, and a lot of these values, if as you re would read in your unit's notes, are based on human rights. We all have a right to life. We have a right to access to the same benefits as other people, and we should have a right to access opportunities. We have a right to a voice, to a say, to a vote, a right to family, a right to be loved, and a right to love freely. So, 
in short, when in, in when we're talking about cultural competence in social work, it's important to remember this golden rule and not just at the micro level when we're engaging our clients, understanding their background, etc. But even looking at it from the different levels of society. In your community, are there systems in place? Are there blockages that prevent particular individuals in your community from um, being their best selves, from achieving their highest potential? And what about the macro level? Are there laws in your country? What is the government's policy towards um, particular people groups? Do they show favoritism to some groups and other groups? Um, and we often hear about that when it comes to politics, right? And so as social workers now, our job is to help level the playing field to not just prove, as I keep saying on Harping Over, it's not just about counseling, but it's about advocating. It's about ensuring that everyone has the right or has the opportunity and the means to achieve and fulfill their life goals. So it may mean Cultural competence may mean choosing strengths-based perspectives, choosing empowerment perspectives for people groups that have been traditionally marginalized in society, for people groups that have been oppressed. And the onus is on us now in order to be a culturally competent practitioner, to be aware, firstly, of our own prejudices, our own thoughts, our own ideas, our culture, and how our culture and background influences the way we view people. And we also need to be able to have a good knowledge of other people. We need to know what are the different the language differences within the 20-something-year-olds, the I generation versus the, the, the boomers. What about your millennials? Um, is there a different language between your Hispanics, um, persons in an upper-class society as opposed to the lower class, the slangs? Language is, is not just about Spanish and German and French and Dutch, um, but it's also about the slangs and the sayings so that when you're engaging your client, even at the micro level, you understand and are able to teach and explain to them in a way that they um, that is meaningful to them. It is understanding history, people's history, not just the individual, but a people group, being familiar with the geographical background, being familiar with the religious customs, being familiar with the norms of the groups at the, at the various um, at the various beliefs, beliefs practices. And it's about showing respect. Respect for yourself. So it may mean acknowledging that, hey, this is my bias. I am biased against men from this particular country because I believe they're aggressive. It's understanding that, respecting that, but not just cho choosing not to be discriminatory about it. It's being respectful enough of other people that you are open to consider either referring if you are unable to let go of these prejudices or making that mental shift so that you can become a better practitioner to meet all peoples and ultimately respecting other people in the process. Our final slide highlights some of the indicators for competent, culturally competent practice. And this is on the last couple pages of your notes. So it's 10 points. In order to, to know whether an agency you're working with or you as a social worker or as a helping professional are culturally competent, you need to consider your ethics and values. And this is why I was talking about the idea of your culture, your background, um, self-awareness, understanding and ethics and values and self-awareness go together. And it's also important to be cognizant of the ethics and the values of your community and of individuals' communities. So what is okay in one and normal in one society or one group may not be normal in another. 
So for example, um, while I was working as a health education officer at our, in the, attached to the HIV AIDS unit in Trinidad, um, we were doing some outreach in a particular community and there, um, I got to learn that in that cult, in that, in their culture, the woman would have several, um, baby daddies. That's the, the term I like to use, right? And even though the partner she was with may be living with her um, in the apartment or living with her in the same house with them, it was normal and expected that the fathers of the other children she had would come and have conjugal visits with her. It was normal. It was expected. It was a, a understood um, norm because that was their way of exchanging goods and services. So the child's father came with pampers, milk, and money, and she came with her honey, right? And in another society, that is unethical. How could a woman have several partners? And more so, how could her man, at the, that the one that she was living with, be okay with that? But they were, they, it's two completely different cultures, two different backgrounds. It was the norm at that time. So we have to understand that if, let's say in that scenario, the woman came to us to ask for financial assistance, our job as culturally competent social workers is not to tell her, well, she has to stop sleeping with the man. It's not to tell her that, you know, she is, she is woman here, her raw, she don't need no man and all of that. It's to give her information and remember clients right to self-determination. We also have to take into consideration the ethics. Remember, we talked about the priority of ethics and the value of life. So we would give her information about um, safe sex practices. We would mention and ensure that she is taking care of herself and her other children. Um, but ultimately, we have to focus on what she came for, financial assistance. And so understanding our own values, understanding the ethics and cultures of the communities, um, and having those cross-cultural skills. So the way that I interact with you um, you would have noticed while delivering this lecture, there are times that I would use um, local parlance and jargon, and then there would be times when I put on my professional voice. Now, when I'm interacting with you all in class, as opposed to doing this recording, it's chalk and cheese, and it's very different than if I were to do an academic presentation to uh, at a university. And it, it even would differ if I were to do the same presentation. Let's say I'm doing a presentation on child abuse. It would be very different if I were to deliver that message um, to a group of teenagers. We have to be able to switch. I know there was a video going around sometime about code switching. Um, we also have to be knowledgeable of the relevant services available to various cultures and clients. Another one would be, um, we talked about empowerment and ad advocacy. Um, having, being a part of a diverse workforce is obvious. And having professional education. So part of being a social worker is, in some regards, it's challenging the areas of discomfort. So it may mean going to a course to learn about the plight of Venezuelans and migrants. It may mean going to a course on gay sexuality. It may mean going to a course on um, reform for child molesters. These are areas that we may not be comfortable with or for if you're an atheist, it may be going to a course to learn about pro-life perspectives, right? Um, sorry, it, not all atheists are pro-abortion. I'm just put that disclaimer there. Um, but it may mean going to learn about different religions. If you are an atheist and how, especially in the Caribbean context, how that will impact on your work. We talked about language diversity. And lastly, um, they say the Na National Association of Social Workers in the United States say that cross-cultural leadership is another indicator. Being able to take the lead 
and to confidently navigate various cultures. So that brings us to the end of our lesson today on cross-cultural leadership. I hope that this was beneficial to you. And I hope that moving forward, as you go throughout the rest of your program, whether it be in psychology or social work, that you remember the principles of um, being flexible and understand that in the helping professional, in the helping profession, we are all designed, all of the different professions are designed ideally to work together. So I wish you all the best. Stay safe in this time. And... May God bless us. God bless us, everyone.